So now for our final panel of the day. Um, this, this panel is entitled How Spanish Language News Can Impact Civic Engagement. And it's all driven by research done by Yamil Velez, who is at the end of the room, at the, of the row here, who studies Latino civic participation in Spanish language media. And in his years of research has determined that the most common form of Spanish language media in the US, commercial broadcasts, doesn't mobilize Latinos and has not protected them from the onslaught of misinformation. And over the past year, he's teamed up with three nonprofit local media outlets to learn whether their approaches have a different effect. I wonder what the answer is. Uh, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, joining the conversation will be Madeline Baer. She is the founding director of El Timpano. Maritza Felix, who is an award-winning journalist at, uh, and writer and producer for uh, Connecta, Arizona. And Angelica Santa Venez Mendez, who recently joined Enlace Latino as a director of development. Um, I will let Yamil take it from here, and thank you all so much. All right, thank you, thank you. We, we, we want to thank the uh, Google News Initiative for funding this project. So it's, uh, we're lucky that, that we had this announcement uh, right before um, because in some ways we are direct benef beneficiaries of, of um, this generosity. Um, so I, I want to uh, start this off with a, a personal story um, which kind of explains the way that I, I got in touch with Madeline and this broader community of, of uh, you know, nonprofit uh, media um, uh, organizations. And it, it starts with me sitting next to my abuela uh, growing up, um, for those of you who don't know, abuela's grandmother, um, watching uh, El Noticiero, Telemundo, um, uh, you know, pretty much Monday through Friday. I would sit on our couch, uh, seven o'clock, um, we would uh, talk about politics, and it's something that really activated and made me feel um, like I could participate in this political process. Um, and so I ended up in grad school, I'm studying immigration, and a lot of the literature was focused specifically on basically how native-born uh, Americans uh, were responding to immigrants moving into their communities. Um, and I felt like uh, what was being left out of literature was how uh, Latinos themselves felt about, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, coming into uh, a, a, a political power um, in, in, in the U.S. And so I wanted to look at different ways in which um, the population could be mobilized and, and, and could, could become more politically engaged. And so naturally, I, I went back to my experiences of sitting next to my grandmother and thought, let me study Spanish language news. Let me see its effects on um, political outcomes. And no matter what uh, data um, I would uh, analyze, I would continue to find either no effects or in some cases negative effects of access to Spanish language TV. For me, that kind of created a bit of an identity crisis. You know, I was expecting that um, the same medium that mobilized me would mobilize others it wasn't working out. And so instead of, uh, I think, settling into that kind of depressed state of figuring out that my research agenda um, would go nowhere, I wanted to find solutions. And so I stumbled upon a report by um, uh, CUNY uh, that discussed innovative methods uh, for reaching uh, uh, Latino immigrants and came across a blurb about uh, Madeline Baer's uh, uh, work in, in the Bay Area. And so um, I remember I'm, I'm in my uh, very small uh, New York studio. I had just started at Columbia, and I give Madeline a call. And I tell her, I'm a political scientist. I'm really interested in the effects of Spanish language TV. I found that it didn't have a positive effect. Um, but I'm reading here that in this report that you're doing some really exciting stuff, and I want to test it. Madeline was like, how'd you get my number? <laughs> 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 but um, in, in all seriousness, this is a relationship that, uh, you know, we uh, developed over uh, um, uh, a year or so discussing um, ways in which uh, we could bring research and praxis together. And with the global pandemic and the rise of Latino targeted misinformation, we, we had an opportunity to study this with uh, the, this uh, generous grant from the uh, Google News Initiative. So um, this, this is uh, um, uh, the outcome of uh, this, this uh, project. Um, and so to begin, um, the, there has been a lot of reporting on the rise of Latino targeted misinformation. A lot of this starts in 2020 um, with uh, various journalists like Sabrina Rodriguez at Politico, for instance, uh, discussing um, uh, conversations in WhatsApp that had spiraled out of control. People just um, spreading uh, deliberate falsehoods um, uh, throughout their uh, social networks. 
Um, and uh, the way I think about this is this is a broader kind of gap in uh, Latino media ecosystems and possibly immigrant media ecosystems more broadly, um, where um, lots of uh, growing immigrant communities in places like the Midwest, for instance, have inadequate access to content that speaks directly to their experience and in some cases um, provides content in, in um, uh, language in, in you know, uh, multilingual communities. Um, even when there is access to some of these outlets, um, many of these uh, uh, organizations, which uh, you know, tend to be commercial entities, also often have to kind of uh, walk this fine line between profitability and, and uh, these kind of mobilization objectives. Um, and so you see a lot of prioritization of entertainment. And so uh, this is, I think, lays the groundwork for some of my previous work, which has suggested that it, it, um, some of these outlets don't have the mobilizing effects that we would expect. Um, and so what was, what is uh, desperately needed are outlets that uh, specifically are providing uh, political information that are trying to get uh, folks civically engaged and doing it in such a way that respects the community that speaks uh, to them in their language. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to do before getting into our intervention, which was we wanted to assess Specifically, what's the effect of following one of these, uh, you know, these wonderful outlets here? Um, we wanted to get a sense of a read on um, how uh, Latinos across these various areas, specifically Spanish-speaking Latinos, felt about the media. And so we can see is kind of lukewarm views on Latino-oriented uh, media. So uh, whether uh, Spanish language news provides community relevant information, just a bare majority, um, whether the news provides accurate information, um, about a third of participants uh, uh, reported this in our baseline survey. And so uh, from this initial study, we found that um, there was uh, evidence that for the most part, people felt lukewarm. They weren't ex extremely excited about the commercial um, outlets and that uh, they were actually open to trying uh, new outlets. So um, uh, just, a, uh, just over 50% were willing to su subscribe to a new uh, media organization. And so what we wanted to do was assess um, what happens um, when you now provide people with access to one of these innovative outlets. One of, one of the, uh, I, I think, uh, distinct advantages of uh, what these folks bring is a kind of two-way approach to their audience, where they're not only providing content um, to audience members, but they're also receiving information via text, via WhatsApp chats, uh, where they can directly kind of respond to the information environment in a way that maybe uh, the traditional media outlets cannot. Um, and so what we wanted to do was assess how do these innovative um, outlets affect uh, various political outcomes that we might be interested in? Um, and so we conducted what is the first randomized control trial on the political effects of Latino-oriented media. Why are we using an RCT or an experiment? Because um, we want to ensure that uh, folks who um, are uh, uh, either consuming the, these new outlets or consuming commercial media, that they look similar in terms of background characteristics. That we don't have, for instance, people who are highly politically in, in, involved subscribing to them and, and therefore kind of creating a spurious correlation. And so what we did, we, we ran an experiment much like you would kind of in the medical sciences and political science is a very common approach. And we implemented what's called a standard of care design um, where uh, half were randomly assigned to commercial media so they could follow Telemundo Univision uh, for two months and the other half uh, followed the community centered outlets. Um, to ensure that people were actually consuming the content, um, they basically uh, were asked to fill out quizzes every couple of weeks to ensure that they were kind of following the content and, and following the news. And this was true for commercial media and the community-centered outlet. We wanted to kind of create the, the best test of the two. Um, after two months, we dropped the incentives. Um, so we said, hey, you can go back to your life. Um, uh, you know, don't worry, we'll keep doing what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, don't worry, like, uh, feel free to, to um, you know, yeah, go back to your daily routines. Um, and what we ended up doing was uh, re-interviewing participants three weeks later. So um, we dropped the weekly quizzes, and then we re-interviewed them, and we wanted to see, are they still following the new outlets? Um, or was this something that was just unique to our study? that you know, when we were paying them, surely they were following the outlets, but not um, after, afterwards. Um, and so what we found in, in terms of our study was that the community-centered uh, news outlets versus the commercial outlets increased political efficacy. So uh, participants who were following uh, El, El, El Timpano, Conecta, or Enlace Latino NC, um, they uh, were more likely to agree that they felt like they could participate in the political process. 
They were more likely to uh, be knowledgeable about local news events. So for instance, uh, policies that Maritza was reporting on in Arizona, folks were more knowledgeable about what was going on at the state level. And this didn't come at the cost of less knowledge about national politics. So if you ask them about Dobbs, you ask them about all of these national news events, they were just as knowledgeable. So there wasn't a substitution process. Basically, they were help, uh, helping complement uh, people's knowledge of what was going on at the national level with a local, uh, locally oriented information. Um, and we also found that um, even after we dropped the incentives, after we said, hey, we're not no longer doing these quizzes, quizzes roughly uh, 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 three quarters of the participants still continued following these outlets. So they were filling a really important niche uh, within uh, their community. This was not something that was study specific. They actually found that um, uh, by consuming these, these new outlets, they were, they were really filling an important need. What was really striking about the findings was that the effects were uncovered even among uh, Latinos who had a strong preference for entertainment. So these weren't just news consumers who were political junkies. These were also people who were uh, open to you know, watching telenovelas who were now becoming even more politically involved as a result. Um, this, you know, a lot of the analysis that we conducted was based on various quantitative measures, but throughout um, the study, we used WhatsApp surveys um, to get a sense from uh, the viewers about what they liked. When asked about commercial uh, news, uh, so, you know, uh, some of the respondents would highlight um, you know, a perceived bias and a lack of objectivity. Um, uh, so um, uh, uh, this is in Spanish. I wanted to preserve the native, uh, the native language here. Um, but um, you, know, you can kind of tell, uh, given the, the, the similarities between English and Spanish on this front. So a lot of propaganda, more opinion than news, um, and uh, often with references uh, or information, it, it wasn't sufficient or appropriate given the themes. Um, and this is distinct from uh, some of the open-ended uh, texts that we got from Community News, where they wrote about how they were you know, approaching uh, the coverage of local and national news from a more kind of neutral standpoint. It's clear, it's short, it's neutral. What's, what's really effective about um, what these folks are doing is that in, 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 instead of bombarding people with information, they try to give people really kind of uh, efficient snippets of what's going on, right? You're, you're working with platforms like WhatsApp and, and SMS where you can't give people a, a dissertation. Uh, you have to give them, you know, 150 words or 200 words or less, right? And so um, uh, a, a lot of folks commented on, you know, the ease of, of access to this information. Um, which was also highlighted here, uh, e easy to understand. Me gustó la información, es clara, es, es fácil de entender y me entretiene. Um, here this is saying, you know, I like the information, it was clear, it was easy to understand, and I, it was entertaining. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is, I think, one step um, in, in, uh, in the direction of, uh, a, a, I think, a broader research agenda and a broader of evaluation approach, I think, that, um, that there are probably many uh, wonderful outlets um, that, uh, if, if they want to show how they stack up against commercial news outlets, uh, there are many of these studies that, are, that, are, that I think are ready to, 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 to be conducted. Um, and it's especially important, given the community, uh, given issues like misinformation, and, and, and lower levels of engagement that we might see um, specifically within uh, communities uh, of, of, of recent uh, immigrants. And so um, I, I see the, um, these outlets as filling a really important um, the gap uh, within, uh, within not only uh, the research uh, literature, but also in, in terms of American society and democracy more broadly. Um, and so I want to pass this on to uh, my partners um, that can talk about specifically their secret sauce um, that, that was uncovered through this study. All right, so fun fact, I just started three weeks ago. <laughs> so I feel like I was invited to the grand finale, to the big party, and, and I kind of like missed out on the process of all of this. Um, I just want to really enhance the work that Enlace Latina was able to bring in with, along with these fabulous uh, group of people that I'm up here with. Um, I'm a little nervous. Um, and so basically, Enlace Latino um, really started back in 2016 with the threat um, of really marginalizing uh, the Latino community in North Carolina. Um, and this all goes back to politics. Um, you might have all heard it. We Latinos were categorized as um, the worst of the worst. Uh, Mexico was sending the worst of the worst. And so there was a lot of misinformation. And first of all, a lot of 
categorizing um, the Latino community and just really excluding us um, from a lot. Um, over the course of the years, uh, the Latino community has really grown in the state of North Carolina. Um, we are at 10.7% of Latinos in North Carolina, which is over half of the nation, of the, of the national average. Um, so over the course of, of time, um, Paola Jaramillo and Walter Gomez, who are our co-founders, um, decided to launch this project. And it started off um, under a fiscal sponsor, basically wanting to cover local and federal uh, politics, immigration policy, and just everything that was going on at the local level. Um, because, you know, who better to understand it than Latinos themselves, right? Um, and so basically they started with a website. And then eventually they noticed that, you know, there was um, more need beyond the website, so then they also did um, the WhatsApp, which I hear a couple other folks that are also using WhatsApp and, you know, engaging with the audience through WhatsApp. Um, also through a podcast, so we're actually the first um, Spanish Latino podcast in the state of North Carolina, which is amazing. Um, and then also social media, so we're also very active on social media and we also do a lot of engagement um, with our audience and I would say over the course of time, um, I've always been a really big fan of Enlace's uh, work, and so happy to say that this, um, you know, also really helped us uh, as far as like audience and expansion and everything. Great. Um, and hi, I'm I'm Madeline Bear. I'm the founder of El Timpano. I founded El Timpano about six years ago. Um, again, really to uh, address gaps um, in local journalism that informs, engages, and reflects the more than one million Spanish-speaking uh, immigrants in the Bay Area, as well as the thousands of indigenous Mayan immigrants. Um, and our special sauce, if you want to move to the next one, is that all of our strategies are really shaped by the communities that we serve. Um, so we really didn't start with any we, we kind of blew out the window any assumptions of what news must look like, um, which is why you know, our, our work looks quite different from your average news organization. Um, we invested about four years of really just a lot of community outreach and engagement. Um, we surveyed hundreds of immigrants in East Oakland to really hear from them what issues are important to you, where do you get news and information, uh, what sources do you trust? Um, and what do you want to see? Help us create a, a new vision for Spanish language news that would serve your needs. Um, and out of that, we've developed a number of different strategies um, that address those needs. Uh, text messaging has become our primary platform for distribution and engagement. Uh, our platform now reaches more than 10% of Oakland's Spanish-speaking households, as well as immigrants across 40 different Bay Area cities. We've also developed um, a video platform um, developed with and for indigenous Mayan immigrants. And we have uh, in-depth English language reporting that really amplifies the stories that, the com that our communities are bringing to our attention um, and which you can find on our website. And I think that brings to me to, to you know, that first phone call I got from Yamil. I did not ask who gave him <laughs> my phone number. Um, but I thought his, as he was explaining his research to me, I found it so fascinating um, because it is counterintuitive. But, but then I thought a bit more about what we heard when we spoke with, with hundreds of immigrants and we heard so many critiques of existing commercial Spanish language media. Um, people told us it's, so, it's too sensational, I don't believe it, it's really just to entertain us. Um, and people told us, like, I want news I can use. I want news that, that helps me connect to local resources, that helps me connect to my local elected officials, that amplifies the stories of our communities to voters and to our city council members and to wider audiences. Um, and so I started to see that, that yes, you know, there, it's, it's great to know now that there is data um, to show show that you know, not only the, the, the problems um, of commercial media, and, and I think many of those are rooted in, in the business model, um, but also data that now, sh now shows the impact of this very different format of providing news that informs and engages uh, Latino immigrants in, in these different ways that we're doing it. 
Hola, buenas tardes. How are you feeling? I know that we are the last session between you and Happy Hour, so bear with us. We're going to make it happen. Maritza Felix, I'm Latina, I'm a Mexican, and I'm an immigrant. And I launched Connect Arizona in May of 2020, and I'm going to tell you why. The pandemic hit, I was working on documentaries, I was a freelance journalist, I had my whole year planned around it. Then the pandemic hit and border restrictions separate my family. My mom and my brother and my nieces and everybody stay on the Mexican side of the border and I stay in Arizona and I was the only one who was able to go back and forward because there were not essential travelers and they stay over there. So I'm the so-called queen of WhatsApp. So my mom every, mo every morning sends me like, good morning, mijita, with a prey and a flower and glitter and all the music that you can think of. And then she was sending me, mijita, when, when, when I, coronavirus is going to go away so soon, just drink baking soda with hot water and a cup of, like, a drop of lemon, and you'll be fine. It's like, mom, I'm not quite sure that that's how it works. I don't know. I don't know. But let me find out. So I start doing fact-checking for my mom. And then I created a very small WhatsApp group with my mom, my husband, my aunts, my comadres, and that was it. And then by the end of May, the group that I created uh, reach the limit. And there was more people wanting to have more good information, fact check information about the pandemic and border restrictions and immigrations and mental health and grief across the border during the pandemic. And that group that started with like 12 people now reaches 100,000. So in Arizona, even though we had those border restrictions, we were building bridges and we are still bu building human bridges where others are still building walls. And community is where we start. Is we listen first. That's when I ask, when people ask me, it's like, what do you do for a living? It's like, I listen people. This is like, and I have coffee with people and, and, and I do, see? I'm still working my coffee mug over here. And our metal in, Co in Connect Arizona, so we started like a very small WhatsApp group. We have multiple products right now, but our heart still beats on WhatsApp, even Meta doesn't like it, as Nico said in the morning. Well, we send direct messages. Uh, we always have an expert on hand. We make the expert to join us in the WhatsApp group and answer the community questions directly with no like people in the middle. We have a very good sense of humor because when you're happy, you are more receptive to news. When you feel relaxed, you are more open to listen even and to have those tough conversations that we need to have. And, and we're, we know that we have so many things that divide us within Mexico and the US, but we have family, we, we have food, we have music, we have tradition that actually unite us. So we have more things in common the things that separate it. And even though politics doesn't understand that, our family does. So we're, we're that building, uh, that bridge between those communities. This is my community on the Sonoran side. We did a cafecito in the middle of the pandemic, working our like Connect Arizona, face Max, and our coffee mugs and everything. And then I have the last one. So this is who we are right now. So we have WhatsApp and that's, and we have thousands joining us on WhatsApp. And a cafecito, I invited Madeline to a cafecito and it's like, oh my God, this is crazy. We have 300 messages in one hour. And we go from Biden to Trump, then to the Kardashians, and then we come back to whatever is going up, is the smoke or like the border or how expensive everything is. Then we have broad, broadcast lists for people that they're like shy, they don't want to participate, but they still want to know about the news of the day and they want to know which experts we're going to have in a cafecito. For example, today, we're going to have two experts that are going to talk about the saguaro census that is going on in Arizona because the saguaros are dying and we live in a desert. Now we have a radio show too. And then from the radio show that we have done more than 500 interviews already, we launch a newsletter because we have so much to say. It's like we do so many interviews and the newsletter is the only Spanish speaking newsletter in Arizona. In Arizona, one of every three is Latino or Hispanic. And from seven millions that we are, at least one million rather to speak Spanish at home. And that's really important. And we are underserved. And another uh, Spanish-speaking news, um, newspaper closed last month. And when one newspaper closes, we all lose. 
And then last year, because we had the time, the resources, and because we love to experiment, we launched a podcast for WhatsApp, a podcast for WhatsApp. And it's like, it was easy to, to, to download. It, actually, it downloaded immediately to your phone. It was easy to listen. It was attractive. It was the good stories about the border that nobody else tells. And we chose only freelancers in Spanish who live in the border to tell those stories. They were amazing stories. And then we experimented on WhatsApp. We did really good. And then it's, we decided to partner up with a lot of media outlets. And we had more than a million listeners. And we had thousands of messages saying, we need this. We need to start reclaiming, reclaiming the narrative of the border. So that's what we do in Connect Arizona. We have coffee. We listen to the community. We get inspired. We then create. And we never stop playing. So now. I think we want to open up the conversations to say how we, as Spanish speaker, identify the means and disinformation that is being uh, shared on those channels that are not the typical for your news. Doing news for WhatsApp, there's a lot of people who say, it's like, that's not journalist. It is, it is, because we do all the fact checking, we do everything. Sometimes we're really informal, but we're really informative. So Madeline, Angelica, tell us a little bit how do I, you, how do you identify the misinformation on your platforms? Yeah, I mean, misinformation has been a huge issue um, facing the communities that we serve. You know, I, I think of um, our approach as kind of two ways. One is really our, our primary approach of providing um, a relationship of trust with our audience, or creating a relationship of trust with our audience, and then providing news and information in a two-way platform um, is preventative. Um, it prevents misinformation because people know they have a source that they can go to if they have a question. Um, and so we actually saw a lot of that in 2021 when so much of what we were doing was providing people with information about the COVID-19 vaccines, what they were, who's eligible now, where you can get one. Um, and because our platform is a, a is two-way communication, we received more than 1,500 questions in just 2021 alone uh, to answer people's questions about the vaccines. And many of them were like personal health questions that were um, leading to their vaccine hesitancy, but they they wouldn't have been answered in massive um, PSA campaigns about the vaccine. So they would ask us, they would say, hey, I'm a cancer survivor, is this safe for me? And we would look into it and get back to them. Or they would come across, you know, rumors that, that, that they heard from their neighbor or their relative, and they would bring it to El Timpano and say, hey, you know, have you heard this? Can you look into it? And we would get back to them. Um, so that's one way that, that we have really worked to combat misinformation. Um, we also developed our own workshop um, because we realized we're probably not going to be able to identify and debunk every single piece of misinformation that's circulating in our community. And so we developed a workshop um, with you know, uh, both national experts on misinformation um, as well as local community partners. Um, so that's, it's really designed with and for Latino immigrants um, on how to identify and defend the spread of misinformation in your own community. Um, and we've worked with schools, with promotoras groups, with health clinics um, to facilitate this workshop. And we've now trained dozens of community members to really be the first line of defense against misinformation. And North Carolina is not the friendly state for an immigrant. How do you combat that misinformation? Because there are so many interested interests going on over there. So I believe um, number one thing is not making assumptions. Um, it's very important not to assume that people know or that, you know, that they don't know or that they don't um, seek certain information. Um, so I think number one, where we were talking about, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying, um, really going back and listening to the community and basically 
breaking it down to maybe like even a third grade level because we do have a high um, migrant Latino community and a lot of these uh, migrant farm workers travel from Central America and a lot of them don't have even like a middle school um, grade level, yeah. Um, so basically I think it would be that, just breaking everything down at a very, very basic level um, and just being super honest and eventually growing um, the trust um, with the community. I'd like to ask Emil, I mean, you've studied misinformation in Latino communities. How does this research, what does this research tell you about kind of effective approaches to combat misinformation within Latino communities and the role that media can play? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, one of the most common interventions that we have for dealing with misinformation is fact checking. And fact checking is great. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want us to disinvest uh, from fact checking. But it, you know, it, it tends to be uh, a, um, you know, in, in, in thinking about this, um, this uh, analogy of, you know, prevention um, versus kind of like treating, treating uh, the underlying disease, um, the, the challenge with fact checking is that often you might get there too late, right? People have already consumed the misinformation, they've adopted it. Um, and now they might have firm beliefs in these false claims. And what would be better is if, again, when these claims are, are circulating, one, we know that they're circulating because audience members are communicating with media organizations and letting them know um, what they're seeing in their social networks. Um, but two, also uh, having effective sources for combating the misinformation like uh, you know, trusted journalists. Um, you know, one of the, again, challenges with fact-checking is if you look at um, uh, Spanish language fact-checking, uh, it really has its origins in, in 2016, right? Whereas in the English language space, um, it's, it's been around for a much longer time. And so um, these kinds of institutions take time uh, for, for people to kind of develop trust in them. Um, and, and so I, I think, I still think ultimately uh, what we need to do to address the misinformation problem is to invest in longer term solutions where you are injecting um, uh, more quality basically into people's information environments um, rather than kind of swooping in there at the last minute and saying, hey, what you, what you saw, what you heard from your, your aunts and uncles, that's completely false like it's going to be really hard to fight that battle um uh you know especially given that these institutions like fact checking have, have not been with the latino community for, for very long oh there are no resources because remember we spanish speakers we all always have like the tiny slice of the cake sometimes we need to work with the leftovers of somebody else's so our staff is always overwork and underpaid. Our newsrooms are always under-resourced. And that's a reality that sometimes there is people that is not, not ready to have this conversation. Well, we can have a cafecito and we can talk about more about this. Another thing that is really important for us, for you to know, is like we don't want to be a traditional media outlet. We don't want to be a massive media outlet. We know that we want to be hyper-local, that we want to be serving the same underserved communities that we belong to. This is, not, this is not us versus them. This is we. This is us because we live there, are our neighbors, there are our kids. We go to the same school. We go to the same pizza place. And something that we have learned is listen first. How do you listen to your audiences? How do you listen to your community? For me, it's WhatsApp. But when I work on TV, there was this contact us form that nobody ever checked, and it was nobody ever filled. And if you were not a newsworthy story, no one, no one was getting back to you. Who's listening to the audience? We as journalists, we're so used to be providing information all the time, assuming what is the breaking news or what the community needs. And when I was listening in Connect Arizona, for example, the first couple of shots that we had with a cafecito, it was like, that week they didn't need any immigration information. They didn't wanna know any more about border restrictions or how, how lengthy the process was for visa or for green cards. They wanted to know about essential oils because they were reading that if you put peppermint on your face mask, you're gonna be protected against coronavirus. And that was not, not real, but I never thought as a journalist that I was gonna be looking for an expert on essential oils to invite to El Cafecito and to tell them not put that essential oil in the cafecito because they were doing that too. 
because you're going to get sick. So stop assuming, start listening, get inspired, and then start creating. We need to like forget so much of what we have learned in journalist school. And, and, and it's the same with the business side of it. Yeah, and we're going to take questions in just a few minutes, um, but you touched on um, on a few things that I want to build on in, in terms of, you know, why I think this research is really important. Um, and, and you know, I, I think for the three of us newsrooms, the research was not surprising, you know, because we're in constant conversation with our audience. Um, but um, because we produce journalism in a language other than English and in non-traditional formats, um, we have a higher burden to explain what we do, to tell that story, and to really connect the dots between this, this newer form of journalism and the audiences that it's reaching and the impact that it ha has. And I know I have spoken with funders, this was before El Timpano put out our, our first impact report, but I spoke with a funder who said, I don't really see how, how this, this model sounds very interesting, but I don't see how journalism produced for immigrant audiences will have an impact. And that is because our industry has had a very, very kind of square understanding of what impactful journalism looks like. You know, it looks like an in-depth in expose, you know, printed or on a website in English that, you know, reaches change makers. And then we have an idea about what those change makers look like. Um, and so I think this research is a really important data point for us and for all of the other um, organizations that are producing news in new formats and for different audiences to be able to make that case and explain, you know, potentially to, to funders who don't identify with the audiences that, that we're serving, that yes, you know, journalism that is produced with and for immigrants in the languages that they speak and in the formats that they use has is making the impact that we all want to see our journalism make, which is to foster an informed community, to help our audiences to, to make decisions and take actions for the betterment of their communities. Yeah, we'll take questions. Uh, my name is Norberto Santana. I'm the publisher for Voice of OC in Orange County, California. Can you speak a little bit about uh, languages as well? The the Sometimes for us, the challenge is some of the kids don't speak Spanish. Some of the abuelas do speak Spanish. Uh, do you approach it that way? Is it Do you go both languages? Some people speak a little bit of one and, and back and forth. So just how do you deal with the dynamic that is language? We go with the flow, but we're so smart in Spanish, and we, we, <laughs> I can tell so many jokes in Spanish. Um, our <laughs> and our WhatsApp is completely in Spanish, but I think that at our the people that we're serving is 30 and up most of the time. We have a couple of 20-year-olds, but it's basically 30 and up, and they're first or second generation. But because we are so close to Mexico, and we go back and forward all the time, we rather consume news in Spanish. They, most of them are able to read and speak Spanish, English, just like me. So I think that's why they, we align so much because people, com our community sees me and listens to me and it's, she has the same accent that I have. It's like she's, she's speaking the same, they see the reflection on the, on the work that we do. We don't do bilingual because we don't have the resources. And we can throw some Spanglish around for sure, but our main thing is in Spanish completely. Yeah, we, um, we essentially serve different audiences in different languages and different formats. Um, our primary, our, our core audience is uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants, um, which does mean that they tend to be older. Um, 
because, and we made that decision because we really wanted to fill the gap for people who, who don't speak English. And that, that is one very significant barrier to accessing information and having your voices heard. Um, we also produce English language journalism that, that is really to amplify their voices and investigate their concerns. And so that's what you'll see on our website. We have a lot of our English language journalism. We also have some of our Spanish language um, news you can use on our website. Um, and then we also serve an indigenous Mayan community as well that speaks a Mon Mayan language. There's a large population in Oakland of Ma Mayans. And so that is a different strategy. Um, so, you know, it's, it really is dependent on the audience. Um, for us, it doesn't necessarily make sense to you know, to translate all that we're doing in Spanish into English because those English speaking audiences would have different information needs or would want their news in, in a different format, a different style. So I think for us, we are completely Spanish as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're rapidly growing um, with Latinos in our state. Um, and primarily we have a high flow of migrant workers. And so primarily the language is Spanish. Um, I do believe that over the course of time when we have like second generation, uh, maybe it's something that we would have to consider. But I do think that, you know, try, trying to stay in our essence, like everything is in Spanish now. Hi, Noe with Benito Link from California. I just had a question. Um, do you guys factor in the different types of Spanish that, you know, maybe South, uh, people from South America speak, Central America, and then the various Spanish that people speak in Mexico? Do we, sorry, what was the, do we? Do you, do you factor, how do you factor sort of the different type different of Spanish system? that people speak? In Conecta Arizona, most of our audience uh, have ties with Mexico, but we have people from seven different countries, and it's so enriching to to hear like the Venezuela accent with a with a with a thing, or the Colombia, and they use different like, epa, y, oh my God, the only other things that I can think is bad words in my mind. <laughs> in the, in those, <laughs> this is so bad. But yeah, but we can we can hear the ac accent when we're like like sending audio messages. But if they're typing, since we use like a very basic Spanish that everybody can understand, is kind of neutral. Is when you're like when we're having cafecitos en persona, that's when we can tell the difference or how do they call. The other day we had an Argentina who was eating tacos with a knife and a in a and, and, and a fork, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> let me teach you something. <laughs> But it was, but the the cultural difference you can tell not just with the language, but their their ideas or the way they they react to some news. You can tell which which countries are more conservative, which are like more aligned with with the Mexican culture and everything. What for us in Arizona? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, let's see, before before we had much of a staff, um, I, I'm, I'm not Latina, I'm not an immigrant, I, I speak Spanish, but I had everything reviewed um, that we would send out through our text messaging platform by my husband, who's from Ecuador. He's also a medical interpreter, so in his hospital setting, he's working with people from all over Latin America. Um, but again, we really try to, to speak a language that is that is most commonly um, understood, and so we will have discussions in our newsroom about, you know, what what that would be. More often, it's actually less about distinctions between um, Spanish dialects or languages, but but around kind of um, uh, jargon and what how how to make language more accessible, um, and if we should use kind of the 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 Spanish the Spanglish version of something versus like the very formal Spanish version. Um, anyways, now our team uh, is comprised of a, a Venezuelan immigrant, um, a Peruvian immigrant. Um, most of our, um, uh, we have an, an a Salvadoran immigrant. Um, and so it's, it's a diverse team which reflects the diversity of, of the communities that we cover and serve. 
I was going to touch on that as well, the diverse team that we have. Um, so we're all Latinos. Um, our co-founder, one of our co-founders is from Colombia. The other one is from Argentina. Um, and we actually have a journalist that lives in Argentina and provides us with, um, you know, a lot, a lot of really good news. And then we also have somebody in Mexico City. Um, we have people from Dominican Republic. I speak Spanglish, first gen. Um, so I think it's just like um, really understanding, you know, the very basic. Um, as you were saying, like when we come in person, we just had our first encuentro, and it was like awing to me, you know, like listening to like all the jargon. And I'm like, oh, like a llevado son, but you know, like it's it's yeah, like it's yeah, understanding that and, and bringing our uniqueness together. Um, thank you for addressing your audiences so well. It's uh, encouraging to hear that there are people like you out there doing that. Uh, what, what really struck me was your ability to listen, uh, hear their questions, hear what they're talking about, then develop your, your content. I found that very interesting. So in the question of listening, we have an audience on on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, that wouldn't know what what's up is and that it's not a two word um, word. Anyway, <laughs> so how would you propose um, listening to an audience that is in a rural environment, um, has an upward um, class, and, a, and nothing really much in the middle and a very a, a lower class working class? Um, and how could you do that with more than just 10 people at a table? So it's, it's just, I'm finding it difficult to think about how to reach out and listen other than one-on-one -on -one coffees or, you know, while I'm in the grocery store listening to what's going on. So it may be a difficult to answer because I'm having a hard time myself, but how do I actually listen to an audience that is so spread out? If I might, I want to take this one. Um, so as I mentioned, um, and I always go back to North Carolina, so we're growing. Um, and if you think about it, in the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot of um, first-time voters that their parents were not able to vote. Their parents, you know, were very silent. And so to me, it's like welcoming the new generation that is going to be able to publicly speak about the different barriers that us as Latino immigrants really face. And so I think thinking about the way that this is going to impact our society in the, in the early, you know, like future upcoming um, is an open invitation to really learn um, and engage with our community um, and just, you know, get to know the community because, I mean, it's growing. We need to understand that listening takes time. So if it requires you to sit down one-on-one -on -one to have a cafecito with a person, it's worth it, believe me. And then you will have 10 person in a cafecito. And then the Listening Post Collective, there is a, um, another organization, uh, a nonprofit organization. They do have this guide on how to do community assessment so you can understand your community and you can see what are the channels that they use to communicate. Because we are so used to asking people to come. It's like, oh, visit our website. Please download the app, like, and share. What are we doing? It's like, we need to go where they are. And when these big fancy media outlets say, it's like, we're meeting the community where they are, it's like, where are you? Because I'm not seeing you here. I'm the one having coffee with people. I'm the one planting trees. I'm the one doing volunteer work because I know that in the churches, in the community centers, in the fairs, waiting for the vaccine, that's where my community is. And that's, and then it's not just like listening what they're saying, it's listening to what they're not saying. Awkward silences are really powerful. When their community is not responding to you, it's because that, that link that you have to them is broken. So you need to repair, you need to win that trust back, and then you can start building. But if you start building right now without listening, with an open heart, from your own privileges and so many other things that we need to do for, to have this active listening, Whatever you build is going to break, and that's why so many media outlets are closing right now, because they never get the lesson that investing time in listening is worth it, and listening is a full-time job. And I'd just add one thing, which is that, you know, all of our news outlets are 
are dedicated to reaching communities that are often described as hard to reach. And there, there is a reason that they are described as hard to reach. There are language barriers, there are technology barriers, there are barriers of trust, there are barriers of time. People lead very busy lives, and so to ask them to come to your meeting, come to this focus group, come to this thing, they might be just as interested in local news and in having their voices heard, but they don't necessarily have the time. So, you know, how can you develop strategies, whether those are listening strategies or your own distribution strategies that, like Maritza said, that meet them where they're at? Uh, I'm Ted, I run Oklahoma Watch. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question you can't possibly answer in this forum, so um, I, I'm just a sliver is all I'm looking for. Um, we believe that we have content that would be very, very beneficial to the Latino community in Oklahoma, which is substantial. And um, we have gone far enough down that path to have the, uh, some of the listening sessions and begun to learn sort of where they are. And, and the two huge things that we discovered on that first go round were that in addition to the language barrier that we have to find a way to overcome, um, and maybe some content delivery barriers, the other substantial barrier is a cultural one. And the example was that as we were doing these listing sessions, um, the Latino community on the south side of Oklahoma City had just been gerrymandered into three different con congressional districts, an annihilating their voting block. And none of them cared. And that was astounding to us. And what we learned at the listening session was that so many of those people were immigrants and grown up in environments where the default assumption was that the government was corrupt and that the default assumption was that your vote didn't count, that that was why they weren't engaged because their belief and their life experience was that it didn't matter. That's a very foreign concept for us. And so, uh, I said it's way too complicated of a question, but if you could provide any insight at all um, as to how an organization like ours might begin to bridge those gaps, um, how we um, find a way to report from within that community in the language they're most comfortable with, and how we get our cultural differences bridged so that we can report from within that community effectively, we would love to know where to go next. I would say try to partner with um, an organization that has already gained the trust of the community. I would start with maybe field ca um, canvassers um, because they already have an open invitation into those spaces. Um, and so whenever they bring you in, they're saying, hey, this person I trust and it's an, you know, like open up to them and, and just really explore the possibility there. But I would definitely suggest um, partnering with somebody that's already well established um, in that space. And explain and make, make conversations. For example, when Hillary Clinton got more votes, but she didn't win the election. So explaining that to a Latino is really hard because in Mexico, in Peru, or wherever you are, the people, the person who gets the most votes wins. And over here, the system is completely different. So you need to explain it like really basic, really fun, and then get to know, like trying to get to know the Latino community is like dating. It's like you need, really need to pay attention to devote your time to, to like, like look at all the details, what excites them, what makes them like be more receptive to you. And then is when you actually get to know the real person. And the Latino community, as we all know, is not a monolithic. So we not all react the same. And we do hate Google Translate. So please stop just Google translating the, the, the articles because you are the SEO is not going to work for you. And we don't like like a bad translation of articles. So we'd rather to have a few with not just translate, with cultural context on it, then a bunch of pieces in Spanish that nobody's gonna read. I, and I would also just add, 
you know, I, it sounds like you're going in with kind of the, the idea that, that you have this information that would be relevant to this community. Um, and, you know, I think I'd just be open to like challenging that assumption and maybe instead go in with a question and, and try to, you know, have a conversation through a workshop or what have you to really learn from them what would be what would be valuable from our newsroom for your for, for your community? What what sort of questions do you have that we can investigate um, that would be valuable to you? And I think our time is up. And this is me, the producer, talking because I know if not, Meta is gonna kill us. But remember, we do believe that the present and the future of journalism is independent and it's collaborations and it's gonna be bilingual whether you like it or not, and we will be happy to work with you. We will be happy to flourish that like we do in the desert against everything, because the desert is gonna be there, but we is still gonna flourish. So muchas gracias por haber estado en nuestro panel. Happy hour. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.